pray for Israel. Amen? You know, we, we prayed yes in our prayer but, um, request, but we want to take a time out to pray for them together and uh, with focused prayer. Amen? But if you don't know, uh, yesterday, amen, Iran launched uh, an attack against Israel. And, um, you know, when we consider what is going on with Israel, Israel is at the focus. They are the center. They are what the Bible calls the apple of God's eye. And so whenever you want to know what is going on in the world in regards to the end times, amen, regarding whatever Russia is doing or China is doing or even the United States is doing, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that when Israel is involved, amen, and so what everything is leading up to, and I'm going to read it here in Zechariah chapter 12, right, and verse 1 says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, and it says, thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Verse 2, he says, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. And so this is prophecy regarding Israel. Now, I'm not saying that this is exactly what is happening but this is where it's leading to. The time is coming where all the nations of the world, amen, will see Israel as a burden. All the nations of the world will be troubled by it. And ultimately, they will besiege it. And so when we consider, amen, the way things happen with Israel, whenever Israel is being attacked, all the nations, including this one, amen, stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. We pray for Israel. But when Israel responds to defend herself, then we begin to condemn them. They begin to say, oh, it's too much. Cease fire. Stop the invasion. Stop retaliating. Stop attacking. Right? And so whenever Israel begins to defend herself, all the nations of the world turn against her and say, you're being too harsh. Right? Your response to what, amen, the enemy did to you is not equal, in other words. And so you need to stop. And understanding that, why? Because, amen, the nations of the world belong to the enemy. They belong to Satan. And Israel is God's nation. And so ultimately, what we find happening is that, you know, last night, if you don't know what is happening, a lot of times we're, amen, caught up in life, caught up in whatever's going on in our daily, that we miss out on what is going on. But... Uh, we got a little clip, and I want you to see it, amen, because maybe you don't really know what's happening, but uh, maybe they could go ahead and play and it. Watch you got something that ready? Here, Terry. We've got confirmed video now of direct hits on Israel coming in, and you can see the, these are devastating explosions. Now, I can't tell you if those are in town. It looks like a populated area. If that turns out to be the case, we're looking at a very dangerous area. You can see the explosions there, Terry. You can see what's happening on the ground in Israel uh, confirmed. Now, that looks to be a populated area if that's true yeah. the world has changed forever on this day and april 13th 2024 will be a pivotal day in world history amen understanding what is happening here again now iran has launched this attack what has been going on there in the gaza strip has been happening with hezbollah which is a proxy of iran iran is using a terrorist network Right? It's hard. When, when a nation comes against you, then you can go against that nation because you know exactly even who it is launching the attack. But when it's a group, then it's hard to really attack a nation or even take out retaliation and defend yourself. But with this attack coming directly from Iran, right now Israel has the opportunity to respond. And Israel doesn't play. Amen? And so... Why this is important, why we pray, because that's what happened yesterday, last night. Israel has not responded. You know, our administration, our president said that, you know, they stood with, with, with Israel and they helped along with other allies in taking out, amen, these missiles as they were flying in. They were drones and also ballistic missiles. And so they were taking them out in the skies. 
But now when it comes down to Israel now responding, America says we will not engage in that with you. We will help defend you. But in your attack and in your response to, amen, defend yourself, we are not going to engage with you. And so, listen, why I'm saying we need to pray is because Israel has not responded as a bit, at least that I know of. But when they do, they're going to stir the pot. Amen. And you're going to see, amen, the nations go in an uproar, of course. And so understand what is going on because God is stirring things up. Amen. And you and I must be aware. We must be vigilant as to what's going on. Amen. Because time is short. Can you say amen? So bow your heads with me. We want to pray. Amen. We know that God is in control. Amen. And what is happening. Amen. Of course, God. Amen. Um, has spoken about it to you and I. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, today we come before you, God, and we stand, God, with Israel. We pray for her, God. We pray for Jerusalem, God. And we ask, Father, for your protection over her, God. We pray your blessing upon them, God. Father, as they're being attacked, God, we pray, God, that your word says that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, Father. God, as the arrow flies by night, Father, we pray that you will frustrate every one of them, God. Use, God, the defenses, God, the defense system, the Iron Dome, God, everything, God, in their power, God, to stop this attack, Father. But, God, nevertheless, as well, Father, as the tensions, God, now there's been declaration of war between Iran and Israel. And, Father, we know, God, that, Lord, the pot is being stirred, Father. We recognize the times that we're in, God. And, Father, we want to have the right response, Father. We pray for Israel. We pray for your blessing, your protection over, and all the people there as well. We commit them to you, God. And, Father, we will continue to pray, God, for Israel, for Jerusalem, God, for its peace and safety, Father. And we commit them to you today, Father. In Jesus' name we say amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Glory to God. Grab your Bibles, open up to the book of Galatians chapter 2. Praise the Lord. And let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word, beginning in verse 6. And the Bible reads, but of these who seem to be somewhat or something, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accept no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you, Lord. We ask, God, at this time, God, as we hear your word, Father, and the word is preached, that our hearts would be open and receptive. Give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us at church today. Help us, Lord, to eliminate distractions, God. Help us to limit the moving around, to silence our phones, God, and to give you our full and undivided attention this morning, Father. May your name be praised, God, at the preaching of your word for your glory. In Jesus' name we all say amen and amen. You could go ahead and be seated this morning. And we are continuing on here in the book of Galatians. Amen. Last week, or yeah, last Sunday, amen, we were able to discuss a little bit regarding Paul and what Paul was doing here in the book of Galatians. You know, when, when we come to messages like this, and we're going through the books of the Bible, sometimes, amen, it's hard for us to understand, right? And, and let me say this, okay, because we as believers, amen, if you're a born-again believer, if you are a Christian, you and I have the responsibility to be learning this book. Hello, somebody. We have the responsibility to be learning what these men of God, these apostles and prophets have written to us, right? We are to, amen, know the Bible, know the word so that we know what it is to be a believer, so that we know what it is to be a Christian and how we are to conduct ourselves in this life. And so as we are reading, amen, the word of God, and as we're going through the book of Galatians, amen, listen, Paul is dealing with some very important issues that happen, of course, in his time, but it's relevant and it's important for you and I today. 
right? So that we have this understanding today of how it is that we are to live, what we are to believe, right? So that we can live it out. And how many know that's exactly what we as Christians, born again believers should be doing? We should be living out the word of God. I got a few amens there. We should be living out the word of God. Amen. amen. We, we don't come, amen, to church as an event. Right? How many of you have been to a baseball game? Right? How many of you have been to a basketball game? Right? How many of you have been anywhere? Raise your hand. All right. So you're still like... <laughs> amen. Right? It's an event. You made a plan to go there and show up and check it out, and then after that you left with no intention of doing anything. It was entertainment. Right? But church is not entertainment. At least not here. Not, not here. We come to receive the word of God for our life. We come to receive instruction. And, and this word, amen, is alive. Amen. We learned that, amen, at our men's group on Thursday. The word of God is alive. It is a sword, a double-edged sword. Hello, somebody. Amen. Right? It is alive. It, it, it cuts between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It, it, it judges between the intentions of the heart. Amen? It knows our motives, and it goes deep. Amen? And so when the word is preached, God speaks to us. God ministers to us. He convicts some of us. Sometimes we're offended at God's truth. Hello, right? You say, what? How dare he call me a sinner? I didn't call you a sinner. The Bible calls us sinners, right? And so when we hear stuff like that, it's God speaking to us, amen? It's the Lord ministering to our hearts. And so again, in review, the book of Galatians, we began, it's important because we got to go back so that we can pick it up so we know exactly where we're at right now, amen, in the passage. And so Paul had opened up his letter to the Galatians with a charge, right? He opened up with a charge to them, right, for having embraced a different gospel, right? I was talking to Brother Josh, and we were talking Thursday night, and we are talking about Bible study, and I said, listen, when you get into the Bible, the books of the Bible, Make sure you read the background, right? Sometimes our Bibles don't have it, so you need to get a study Bible or you need to look it up, and you get the background of that Bible. What was going on, right? How many of you have ever written a letter before? Amen. Amen. All right, five of you. Amen. <laughs> right? You write a letter with a purpose in mind, yes. right? You don't just pull it out and just start writing anything. You have a purpose in mind. You know what you want to communicate. Right. And so you get down, you start writing about it in the same way. This is a letter to the churches in Galatia. And Paul now is writing this letter. Amen. Because he's dealing now with the, the Galatians because they have now forsook Paul's gospel that saved them. And now, amen, because somebody came in, they're called Judaizers, came in and told them that, listen, you're not really saved. I know you heard Paul's message and Paul's gospel, but you're not really saved completely until you also are circumcised, until you also adhere to the law of Moses, right? And so Paul now begins to charge them and tell them, hey, I see that you've embraced a different gospel. Hello, somebody. If he was from the neighborhood, he said, I heard you're claiming the other side. <laughs> Got to talk Latin for us. Some of you are like asleep, like, amen. I heard you ranked out. All right, I'll leave it there. I'm getting too far. Come back, brother. Following that, he begins to defend his own apostleship, right? He begins to defend his own apostleship, assuring them that he was preaching the only gospel, Right? So he has to defend himself. Why? Because in anything in life, we see it happening today. The Judaizers had to, amen, discredit Paul. They had to assassinate his character in order to, amen, affect his message. Right? So if the believers in Galatia got saved by hearing Paul's message or his gospel, they were telling him now, well, it's not enough. And in order then to be able to deceive them and win them over, they began to cut Paul down and say, well, he's not really one of the 12. He, you know, listen, it's still going on today. There are people, well, I just follow Jesus, and Paul wasn't even one of the original 12, right? Listen, so they begin to cut him down, and they begin to try and say, well, he wasn't really one of the 12. He wasn't there with the 12 when Jesus was alive. And so they go after his character. 
in order to be able to try a man and discredit his gospel or his message. We know that happens today, right? When, when people, amen, hate on us. Come on, somebody. Right? You know, they, they don't like what we say, so they try to, amen, pull out our dirt. And I know we all got dirt. Right? Amen. We'll leave that there for another message another day. So Paul went on to say that, listen, any other gospel was no gospel at all. Paul said, the gospel that I preached to you, that's the truth. That's what saved you. And so these other imposters coming around and trying to peddle you another gospel is no gospel at all. Some people will say, well, there's many ways to God. What God? Don't, don't be deceived. There are many people that pray to God. They pray to the Lord. Amen. They only give the Lord all glory and honor. Lord who? Lord Jesus or Lord Satan? Amen. Got to add a name to that. Hello, somebody. There's only one way to God. And that is by way of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, right, 1 and 10, we, we discussed some of that last week. And we see now that Paul, amen, he decides to make a visit to Jerusalem. And why does he go to Jerusalem? This is where we're going to pick it up, right? He, along with Barnabas and along with Titus, amen, go to Jerusalem. And they go to Jerusalem because of the fact that, listen, while they were out there in Galatia, they were winning, amen, Gentiles. A Gentile is anything other than a Jew, okay? So in the world, there are Jews, and then everybody else are Gentiles. So look to your neighbor and say, you're a Gentile. Well, if you're saved, you're the body of Christ. Amen? But ultimately, listen to me. What was going on is that the Jews, the Judaizers, they're called, were telling the disciples, the Gentiles, that listen, I know you got saved under Paul's message, but you're really not saved until you also become circumcised because that was part of the Judaic law. That was part of the Mosaic law. And so this began to discourage the believers. They began to begin to get discouraged. And so when Paul and Barnabas heard about it, they said, what is this? Who's passing on this information? Right? And so it began to have a stir in the Antioch church where Paul and Barnabas were at. And so the church decided, you know what, let's send them to Jerusalem, to go and talk, amen, with Peter and John and James. And let's square this thing out because these guys have come from Jerusalem saying that they need to be circumcised. So let's go back over there and find out. Let's go back to the horse's mouth in a sense, right? How many know there's always hearsay? Right, well, he said, she said, they said, he said, but we never go to the source, right? We start believing, you know, whatever anybody says. And so they decided then to go to Jerusalem to square this thing out. And so, amen, they go to Jerusalem. And when they get there, they come and they begin to communicate what had been going on with their ministry to the Gentiles. That they went out and they began to preach this gospel that Paul preached, right? The gospel of grace, that Jesus died, he was buried and rose from the grave. And all that believe upon that will be saved. And so, amen, people started getting saved. Then come these Judaizers from Jerusalem saying, well, they're not really saved yet until they're also, amen, circumcised. And Paul says, that's not true. But since they've come from Jerusalem, let's go find out if this is what's coming from the apostles there. We want to make sure that we're not in conflict because, amen, we can't have two messages, Right? We don't want confusion, right? The devil is the author of confusion. God is a God of order. And so the very issue at hand now, amen, this issue divided, amen, or threatened to divide the church, and the issue was, again, circumcision. And many times we don't, you know, we, we don't, we read these things, okay, cool, we just read over it. But what is the significance of it? What was circumcision according to, amen, the law? We know what it is physically. Remember, the word circumcised literally means to cut around. 
And as a religious rite, circumcision was required of all of Abraham's descendants as a sign. Somebody say, as a sign. So I kind of gave us a, a little overview last week. But understand that, listen, prior to Abraham being called out, there were no Jews. Okay? There were no Hebrews. Right? All were Gentiles, if that's what we want to say. Okay? And at the Tower of Babel, anybody know about the Tower of Babel where God confused the languages and everybody was scattered throughout the earth? Well, at that point, everybody was in one world. It was, a, it was a picture. It was a type of a one world government, a type of the Antichrist, a type of what's about to happen in the end time, right? Because that's where the world is leading to. That is what is going on regarding Israel in the time of tribulation. There's going to be, amen, a false messiah, a false leader. He will be the leader of a one world government, a one world religion, a one world economy. No one will be able to buy, sell, or trade unless they receive his mark. Right? Well, this Nero in Babel at the time, amen, or, or what's his name, Nimrod, amen, was a type of Antichrist. And all of the people of the earth spoke one language, and they, amen, were all involved in paganism, right? The worship of false gods. And at that time, when God came down to see what was going on, he confused their language and scattered them because they remained in one place. And God had gave the command to Adam and Eve, amen, to, amen, multiply and fill the earth, scatter, amen, inhabit the earth. But they at that time were in one place. Why is this significant? Because all of the people, amen, were of one mind. They were of one language. And so God scattered them throughout the world. But when he did that, he turned them over to the enemy. Why? Because they were all involved in pagan worship, and he turned them over, the nations of the world, he turned them over. And when they scattered throughout the earth, then they began to form nations of different regions of the world. And God then chose Abraham, and he called him out, amen, and he selected Abraham. And from Abraham, he was going to make the nation of Israel, his own nation. He says, all the other nations are following paganism. They're all following the enemy. But I'm going to pull this man out, and I'm going to make my own nation out of him. And from him, this nation is going to bring salvation to the earth. So God, calling Abraham out, made a covenant with him. And he gave him the sign. He gave him circumcision. And he said, this is how everybody would know that you belong to me. Out of all the nations of the world, this is a sign. And from that point on, this is where the Hebrews and the Jews have come from. Circumcision was for a sign. It was a sign, a mark in the flesh. Right? It was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And that those who are circumcised are Jews. This is the work of the flesh the Pharisees put their trust in. They said, because we are circumcised, we are Abraham's descendants. And they, amen, began to pride themselves in that fact, right? To the point they said, regardless, amen, of what people say, what people think, or what we do, we are descendants of Abraham, and the promises of Abraham are for us. They are partly right. In John chapter 8, verse 37 through 47, in Jesus now speaking with the Pharisees, he told them that they were indeed the descendants of Abraham, but they were not the children of Abraham. He said, they are descendants by the flesh. You may have the mark in your, in your flesh that you are descendants of Abraham, but you are not children of Abraham. He says, as a matter of fact, you're children of the devil. Your father is the devil. And he says, the reason why, amen, your father is a devil is because he was a murderer from the beginning and you, amen, are plotting my murder. You want to kill me. And they said, what? They didn't like that. The reason why, yes, they were descendants, and I said this before for us today, that everybody, amen, we're all, amen, God's creation. But not everybody are God's children. We're all God's, you know, creation, but we're not all God's children. We are only God's children by believing and being born again. In the same way, when God dealing with the Jews, he said, you're not Abraham's children. You're his descendants, but you're not his children. And he says, the reason why I know you're not his children is because Abraham 
believed God. When God told him, hello somebody, and gave him the promise that he would have land and heirs, he believed God. By faith, he believed God. And then later on, when God told him to take your son and sacrifice him, Isaac, he did it. He went and he took his son and he was ready to do it. And God said, I know you believe me by faith and I know that you love me because you're willing to obey me regardless. So then how, amen, are our children of Abraham identified? They believe God and they obey God. And so Jesus was telling the Pharisees, you may have the mark in your body, You may have the sign of circumcision that says you're a descendant of Abraham, but your deeds are showing that you're not a child of Abraham. Because if you were a child of Abraham, then you would believe everything that I've been telling you, and you would be doing the good works. It would be evident in your lifestyle. In the Babylonian captivity, the Pharisee, this is where the Pharisee was birthed. And in that time of captivity in Babylon, when Israel was in Babylon, right, the Pharisees now began to introduce what is known as the oral law. See, they had the written law, the commandments of God that was written by the finger of God. And this they obeyed and they were or they were supposed to obey. But because they did not they went into captivity. God turned them over to the Gentile nations, the heathen. Right. Remember. Israel was to be the head of nations, the head, not the tail, okay? But because they didn't obey God's commands, they became the tail and not the head. And now they were subject to those that they were supposed to be over. The Pharisees then were birthed and they began now, because they didn't have the written law with them, they began to introduce what is called the oral law or what we would call today the Talmud. And they added their traditions to the law. They added their own traditions to the law. They added regulations around the written law. They encrusted it with their traditions. They began to add to it. And this is what Jesus was doing in his earthly ministry as well. He came to, amen, listen, take, amen, that crust, amen, to take the dross off of the law. He says, you Pharisees, amen, you, you hold to the traditions of men. You, you have, man, perverted what the Sabbath is all about. They added regulations to the law. This is why Jesus was hated by the Pharisees, because he came and he exposed the truth. And he says, you guys are adding to it, right? They added to the law. Jesus now came and he was removing this crust and this dross from the law of God. And in the same way, listen to me, the hearts of men also needed to be circumcised, right? Because it means to cut around. And in the same way, the heart, amen, becomes hardened. There's a crust. There's a veil around it. Religion, amen, crusts the heart, amen. And it makes you and I believe that we are justified by coming to church or by doing good deeds. Hello, somebody, right? That that if we do certain things, then we're accepted by God and that we're righteous. But God says, no, no. Listen, we got to get rid of the outward. Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, man, you guys are good. You guys are like the the beautiful whitewashed tombs. See, today you and I will go to a graveyard and everybody's buried in the ground. But over there, they would bury them and they would cut tombs inside the side of a hill, a mountain. And they would carve the stone on the outside to make it look nice. He says, he told the Pharisees, that's what you guys are like. Outwardly, you look beautiful. You're great. You're all hooked up with, you know, your, your outfit and your little hat. and You guys look good. He says, but inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Yeah. Outwardly, you're religious and pious and all that, but inwardly, you're dead. And the same thing with men today. We, 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 we can dress ourselves up. We could be successful in life, have the great job, beautiful home, you know, nice retirement, nice pension, whatever. We can look good and and be good. But if we're not born again, if we've not received, amen, Christ and what he done for us on the cross, we are still dead internally. And we will continue to strive, amen, to, to grasp at the things of the world, to bring satisfaction internally, but it's only temporal. The hearts of men need to be circumcised. 
God's desire was that even from the Old Testament. And as he gave him a sign of circumcision, it was outward. But the outward should have made its way to the inward. This is the complete man that inwardly, amen, my heart, amen, enables me to love God. Like Abraham loved God. But then that is also able to be shown on the outside. That we are not just professors of God. That we don't just say we love God, but then our actions say otherwise. Circumcision was made a requirement in the Mosaic law. It was now required, amen, of the Jew to do so. Now concerning the very first issue here, New Testament Christians, listen to me, are no longer under the Old Testament law. And circumcision is no longer required. It was required of the Jews under the law. This is brought out in the New Testament in a number of passages, right? Some that we will read. But as these passages proclaim, right, being delivered from our sins is a result of faith in Christ. It is not by outward, amen, ceremonies. It is Christ's finished work on the cross that saves, not the observance of an external rite. Even the law acknowledges, listen to me, that circumcision alone was insufficient to please God. Who specified the need to circumcise your hearts in Deuteronomy 10, 16. Listen, in salvation, the works of the flesh accomplish nothing. The works of the flesh accomplish nothing. See, Paul then is discussing the role of the Old Testament law as it relates to Christianity. He's saying, listen, let me tell you what the Old Testament says and what the law is. And how does that relate to us today as believers? See, because there's a tendency to mix. Hello, somebody. Right? We have a tendency to mix. And people have a tendency of wanting to put us back under the law. That you need to do this. You need to do that. He argues that Jewish circumcision is only an outward sign of being set apart to God. However, if the heart is sinful, then physical circumcision is of no avail. It means nothing, right? Then listen, if outwardly we do all the religious acts, but our hearts are still sinful, then it means nothing. Rather than focus on external rights, Paul focuses on the condition of the heart. And why is that important? Because we know that the Bible tells that God looks what? At the outer appearance? What does God look at? What does God look at? God looks at the heart. He sees beyond this. He looks to the heart. That's why none of us can hide from God. Right? No sin is a private matter. Sin is not a private matter. Although there may be nobody else around, it's between us and God. And God sees all. Using circumcision as a metaphor, he says that only the Holy Spirit can purify a heart and set us apart to God. Ultimately, circumcision cannot make a person right with God. The law is not enough. A person's heart must change. And Paul calls this change circumcision of the heart, or what we would say, born again. See, true children of Abraham are those who follow Abraham's example of believing God. Physical circumcision does not make one a child of God, but faith does. Okay? Believers in Jesus Christ can truly say they're children of Father Abraham. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Why? Because we have believed Christ. We have believed God. God has always wanted, listen to me, more from his people than just external conformity to a set of rules. See, we can't get it twisted. Right? Religion, we, we do all kinds of some, some you know, denominations and movements require us to do certain things, right? To be saved, to be accepted. You know, maybe, maybe accepted in the local body or congregation. But to be saved and accepted in Christ, 
The only requirement is faith. Faith in what Jesus did for you and I on the cross. Nothing else. We talk about this, and I share this with you because it's important for us to know, to have the understanding of what Paul is dealing with in his time, right? But at the same time, so you and I can understand it as well. Because you and I have a tendency to want to do things, to justify ourselves before God. Sometimes these very things that we, amen, use to justify ourselves are the very things that keep us from God. Well, I'm not a bad person. Why do I need to repent? Well, I, I don't hurt nobody. I don't. I just mind my own business. I don't even say crazy stuff on Facebook. I don't even like crazy posts. But that's what we would call self-righteousness. And that's what keeps us from God. We'll say, you know, well, I wasn't as bad as Gabriel. I wasn't as bad as Batman. <laughs> right? I wasn't as bad as they needed God. They were all messed up. And we praise God for you. Amen. That's good. I like your testimony. Good story. Right? And, and they brush it off and say, I'm not a bad person. I'm not like you. You needed God. I, I don't. When Jesus came, he understood this and he dealt with the same things. To the point that he said, listen, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. It's not the, it's not the healthy, he says, that need a doctor, but the sick. Those who know that they need a cure. Those that know that they're sick. We are sin sick. And we need the healer. We need the deliverer. We need the redeemer. See, there were people in the Jerusalem church who taught that circumcision was necessary to be saved. They also needed to become a Jew outwardly or in their flesh is what they were saying. Oh, it's okay. You receive by faith. That's good. But it's not done yet. You also need to be circumcised in your flesh. You need to become a Jew as well. And what began to turn or, or you know, cause confusion was because these individuals came from Jerusalem. Hello, somebody. They came from Jerusalem. You know, there's a tendency for people to come in other people's name, right? Well, Pastor Gill said, <laughs> Pastor Wally said. And so right away, okay, what is it? You know, and we, we listen because we recognize it maybe as an authority or, okay, leadership. But in reality, that is not what happened. These, amen, were false brethren. Amen, they came to stir up the believers, the Gentile believers. Paul describes them as false brothers. How many of those false brothers in the house? Don't look to the right or the left, amen? <laughs> there's false brothers in Christianity, just like there's false teachers behind the pulpit. Yes. These false brothers came. They, in other words, they weren't real brothers. They, they, weren't, they weren't genuine. They weren't of, amen, the body of Christ. They weren't born again. And it says that they were brought in, Right? They were brought in. And the reason why they were brought in was to bring the Gentile believers into bondage. See, understand that. God sets us free from bondage. And to place yourself back under the law and, and, and all of its requirements, or even just one, puts us back into bondage. And they come in and say, well, I know what you've heard, but, but also let me show you this other teaching here. Let me show you what, amen, the commandments say. Hello, somebody. And they want to put us back under law. Listen to me. The Bible tells us the law is good. The law serves its purpose to reveal that we're sinners. No one can keep the law. Only Jesus was able to do that. The law is not dead. But Paul says, but we, the believers, are dead to the law. The law is not dead. It's still in effect. It's still being used by God to convict the world of sin so that they might come to Christ and believe what he did for them, that they now can become dead to the law. We live by the law of Christ, the law of grace, the law of faith. 
These individuals came to bring the brethren into bondage. He means simply that by making circumcision necessary for salvation, the false teachers were not teaching justification through faith alone, but were dragging the church back to adherence to a system of laws. See, Paul then didn't yield to these false brothers. And he tells the Galatians that he did so that the truth of the gospel, listen to me, might be preserved for you. He says, I didn't give in to them. I don't, I don't know who they are, but I didn't submit to their message, and, and I didn't submit to what they said. We're not going to do that. We're going to hold to what the Lord showed me and what I have preached to you. Why? So that it can be preserved for you, so that you do not have to begin to adhere to their way. See, we concluded last week with the very fact that it's important that we get the gospel right. That we get the gospel right. That we don't make it harder than what it really is. In verse 6, Paul says, but to these who seem to be somewhat or something. He says, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. See, Paul was talking about James, and he was talking about Peter, and he was talking about John. He wasn't being disrespectful. He wasn't being arrogant against him. What he's saying is that these men, amen, who were something in Christ, he says, it doesn't matter to me because they didn't add nothing to me. I came, amen, because God gave me the gospel. God gave me this message. The Lord appeared to me on that Damascus road, and the Lord communicated to me and gave me this ministry. They did didn't assign it to me they didn't give it to me so it didn't matter what they might say or think you know that's a big issue right we have a tendency to waver in our opinions because amen of people we have a tendency oh what's my family gonna think or what's you know my friends gonna think or you know you know some people don't serve God because they're afraid of what people will think or what people will say you know, I've been serving God for over 30 years now. In the beginning, that meant a lot to me, right? But at this point in life, you know, you get older, say, you know, I don't care what people say. Matter of fact, I'll give you something to say. <laughs> Just log on. Just log on. I'll give you great material. Because it don't matter to me. I'm not standing before anybody at the end of this life. I stand before God. I stand before the Lord, my Savior. I want to be faithful to him. I want to fear him more than men. And when we fear men, then listen, we can't serve God right. See, Paul was not intimidated by them. He was not arrogant or disrespectful, but he knew, listen to me, who it was who called him and gave him his commission and gospel. He was not intimidated to share all that God had him to preach. He showed up and he gave an account. This is what I've been preaching. This is what God told me to do. And here's the result. That's why he brought Titus with him. Titus, amen, was one of the converts that was reached by his ministry. and said, we preach this gospel. And he got saved. And look at him. Here he is. He's a Gentile. God saved him just like he saved us. He received his gospel directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't taught to him by Peter or by John or one of the 12. He says, the apostles in Jerusalem, they added nothing to me. Right? And again, that is not being arrogant. What he's simply saying is they didn't give me anything. This authority that I have came directly from God. And so I'm not here to subject myself. I'm here, amen, to make sure that we are on the same page. Amen. Because, amen, people have come from Jerusalem saying something different than what we've been doing. And so I'm here to make sure that we correct this. Verse 7 and 9. But contrary wise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, right? He goes and says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. In other words, the way God moved through Peter to the Jews Amen. God moved also mighty in me to the Gentiles. They recognized that. They seen that. And when James, Cephas, who is Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. That we should go, right, Peter or Paul, to the Gentiles 
and Peter will continue, amen, to minister to the nation of Israel. Now, again, for a moment, we'll, we'll talk a little bit now, and we'll finish next week. But we must also recall why Paul and Barnabas and Titus are there, why they have now come to Jerusalem, why they've come before the church in Jerusalem. And we find that in Acts chapter 15. Turn with me there. We'll communicate this and then we'll close out. But in Acts chapter 15, when Paul is talking in Galatians chapter 2 about going to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15 gives us the actual account when that happened. And the Bible reads in verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, hello, somebody, they, they were in conflict with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Right? They didn't just start a fight and divide the church. They said, let us go and let us resolve this matter. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6, now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when they had, amen, been much dispute, they were, amen, having a council, Peter then rose up, and this is what he says. He says, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us, being the Jews, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. By faith alone, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, plus nothing. This is the very account where Peter is telling them. Listen, he says, listen, brothers. He says, God chose me. God, amen, chose me to go and speak to the Gentiles. He was the first one to go and speak to the Gentiles. And he did that in Acts chapter 10 when he went and he spoke to Cornelius. Amen. Cornelius now in chapter 10 had a vision. Amen. He was in prayer. He was a Gentile man. And he, he was in prayer. He was devout. And an angel came to him and told him, listen, go and call for Peter. Right? Send for Peter to come and to speak with you. At the same time, Peter now was up on the rooftop. He was hungry, but he fell into a sleep or a trance, had a vision. And the vision he had was of this big sheet that came from heaven. And on it were all these different four-footed animals and creepy things and everything that God created. And then a voice from heaven told Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord. He says, no, I won't eat anything that is common or unclean. Right? And then the voice came to heaven, from heaven again and said, do not call anything unclean that the Lord God has made. Amen. This happened three times, right? And then it disappeared. And when it disappeared, the man from Cornelius showed up to Peter saying, hey, Cornelius has thee, come. And he perceived that it was a vision from God. Now understand this. Peter, with that vision, God was trying to tell him, listen, because Gentiles were considered unclean. The Jews were clean, right? Because they were purified by God and his word, his command. But the Gentiles were considered unclean. So God was trying to tell Peter, preparing him, listen, it is time to go to the Gentile. And so kill and eat. Don't call anything unclean that the Lord has made clean. So when Peter shows up, and you guys can read it for yourself, okay? 
But when Peter shows up to Cornelius' house, Peter went, but he took also some other Jewish believers with him as witnesses. And they went to Cornelius' house. And amen, there Peter began to preach the gospel to them. And when he preached the gospel to them, you know what happened? The Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and all who believed. And they received the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues, right? Now, why is this significant? Because Peter now, along with his brothers, believing Jews, they're speaking now to these Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they begin to speak in tongues. And Peter sees that along with the other Jews and says, God is saving them just like he saved us. The work of the Holy Spirit is internal. But the evidence of them speaking in other tongues or other languages was an evidence that the Holy Spirit came upon them and needed to be outward. Why? Because God was doing a new thing. So Peter needed that as a sign because remember when they were at Pentecost and they were in the upper room and they were praying and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Right? When the Holy Spirit came upon them for the first time, They began to speak in other languages. And as they began to speak in other languages, that became a sign that the Holy Spirit had come upon them and had purified their hearts. So these tongues were a sign. They were for a sign, just like circumcision was for a sign. Right? They needed something evident because now, remember, think about it. Everything was directed to the Jews, but now it's being pushed over to the Gentiles. And so in order for them to believe that this was God, God had to give them a similar sign. What happened to you at Pentecost in the upper room is happening now with them. It was a sign for Peter and the other Jewish brothers that what God did with them, he's doing it with them now also. Peter was the one that had to go to Cornelius' house. We know that Paul is the apostle, which we'll talk more about next week, that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. But there was a time in Jesus' ministry. Jeremiah, you guys can make your way up. But there was a time in Jesus' ministry when Jesus now, you know, he had been preaching for a while. And as he was going out and preaching and doing messianic miracles, these miracles that would point and reveal that he is the Christ, the Messiah, he began to ask his disciples because he would send them out preaching too. And he says, who do men say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say that I am? Some say, oh, you know, some will say Elijah, you know. Some will say John the Baptist. And he says, okay. He says, but who do you say I am? And why was that significant? It was significant because at that time, Jesus knew that his people were rejecting him. They weren't receiving him as the Christ and as their Messiah. And so now he was doing public ministry, going out and preaching, But now he changed. Why? Because the hearts of the people were hard. They would not receive him. They rejected him. So now his ministry went from being public to now being personal. And so he asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And they said, Peter responded, you're the Christ. You're the son of God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Amen. Simon, Peter, right? He says, this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He went on and he said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. See, Peter, it wasn't, you know, the Catholic Church says that it is founded on Peter. Right? He's the first pope. Matter of fact, the Vatican is built upon his very bones. But that's not what Jesus meant. See, they said, we're building the church on Peter. But that's not what Jesus meant. He says, on that revelation that I am the Christ, upon that revelation, I'm going to build my church. And from that point on, Jesus said, and I will give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. And so at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And what did Peter do? He went out and he preached to everybody. He had the key and he opened the door with the gospel to the Jews now. They began to preach. 
If you read the Bible clearly, you look from the time of Pentecost to up into chapter 10. Those that went out preaching, that were scattered in the persecution, they were only communicating to Jews only. Up until this time now, because the Lord seen that they were still rejecting him, he's now going to the Jews. And so in order for him to properly, because remember I said God is a God of order. Peter had to be the one because remember he had the keys. So now he had to come and unlock the door to the Gentiles so that Peter could walk through it and go and minister to the Gentiles around the world. Peter had the keys to the kingdom. He had to open the door. The first Gentile group that received the Holy Spirit, Peter preached to them. But that wasn't his sphere. That wasn't his field. He was just there simply to open the door so that God could raise up the Apostle Paul to go and begin to speak to the Gentiles. Peter himself had to defend the gospel, had to defend going to the Gentiles, and had to as well defend what God was doing in the Gentiles from the Jews. Why is that significant? Because you and I wouldn't be here today. If this gospel wasn't going out to the Gentiles, we are what is called, amen, the age of grace. Stand with me. We are in the church age. Today we receive Christ apart from Israel, apart from the law. We're able to be saved today and receive all the benefits by simply believing. When I mean believing, this belief it translates into trust. Hello, somebody. Right? Trust. Have I ever did that, you know, what is it called? The trust walk or trust, trust fall? Right? Get behind somebody. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right? And they go forward. Amen. <laughs> That's trust. God is saying, hey, you and I, we we're, it's not blind trust. Jesus proved that we he could be trusted. Why? Because he went to the cross. He did everything he said he would do. Everything. He died and he rose from the grave. He said he would do that. And so therefore he can be trusted. You and I now, saving faith comes by trusting what he did on the cross for our salvation. You know, people say, well, you need to, you know, you got to prosper and you got to be this and that in order, amen, to be. No, you don't. It's a lot of poor people. In the Bible, there's rich people too. What I'm saying is that doesn't matter. Those are externals. What matters is here. Jesus died on the cross. You know why? To save your soul. Amen. Let me make it clear. God is not so much concerned about our prosperity in this life. Amen. You work hard. You're going to prosper. You do what you need to do. You're going to prosper. You'll be blessed. But that's not why Jesus died. He died to save our soul. That's why people still get sick. Of course, it's because of sin. But people get sick. People die. Listen, we're promised a new body. He didn't die to, amen, paint the barn. He died to save your soul. So that when you and I die, we have eternal life. You're promised. Death is just a doorway into eternal life. Because he lives. We live. Death couldn't hold him down. And therefore, we that are believers are in Christ. Death will not hold us down either. For those that have yet to trust in Christ, that have yet to believe in the salvation and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the saving of your soul, if you hold on to your sins, and you perish in them, you will go to the lake of fire. That is promise. That is in the word of God. You will go to hell. That's a truth. We like heaven. Hello, somebody. We like heaven. We don't like to hear about hell. But what do you think the good news is about? The good news is the fact that you don't have to go there because Jesus made a way out. But if you love your sin, 
more than you love Christ, then you will go where your sins will take you. The Bible says that all fall short of the glory of God. All men are sinners. We need Jesus Christ, the Savior. He died for you. He died for me. Greater love have no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends.